Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Robert Nordland is the founder and CEO of Association Reserves, which has been in business since 1987 and has prepared more than 60,000 reserve studies. Welcome to Take It to the Board, Robert. Don, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Robert, let's start with what you do for boards and managers. What is a reserve study and how does it benefit communities? Well, a reserve study is a capital budget plan that helps boards anticipate and prepare for their major common area repair and replacement projects. So in other words, we answer the fundamental question every board has every year, what should I do about reserves? And does that include just physical components in the community, Robert, like a roof or or, or a clubhouse? Um, or do you set aside money for uh, uninsured losses like a deductible, a large windstorm deductible, let's say? No, uh, we are guided by National Reserve Study Standards, and that's a four-part test that uh, restricts projects to being those that are common area maintenance responsibilities, life-limited with a predictable remaining useful life and above a significant cost to repair or replace. So that weeds out deductibles because we don't know when those types of things are going to happen. It's not a wish list. It's not a um, savings account for uh, capital improvements. It's strictly a way to plan for those major predictable projects that are in front of an association. Now, that said, some of those major projects may not be physical like you said. They may be the five-year elevator load test. They may be the um, sprinkler function test. They may be, in California, the every nine-year balcony inspection, elevated exterior element inspection. In Florida, it may be the, um, or in two counties in Florida, the 40-year certification that then will be every 10 years thereafter. So we incorporate those major projects, those predictable major projects that are essential to moving the building forward successfully into the future. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Robert, it's based on what you have, not necessarily what you're going to have, like in terms of a capital improvement, but this is why I would assume that you have to do periodic reserve studies because your community can change over time. For instance, I have communities that have acquired additional property next door that they may use for overflow parking. Um, They may build, there may be capital improvement projects. And once they've gotten past and completed that project, then that would be an asset or a component for which they would be reserving in the future. Is that correct? Exactly. There may be one of our clients that adds a handicap lift to the pool area. And they do that as a capital improvement, but yet When we go out there to update the reserve study, we say, oh, wow, we need to add this to the list so it gets replaced on a regular basis as it ages and deteriorates. So, Robert, I said that the media has spent a fair amount of time over the last few weeks focusing on the fact that many older buildings may not have fully funded reserves. In fact, some don't have reserves at all. A lot of people down here in Florida are now saying that Florida should pass a law mandating that reserves be fully funded. I believe the state of Hawaii tried that a few years ago. What did they do and and what was the outcome? Like you suggested, I've been asked that question. What we learned was in 1991, Hawaii enacted a law requiring 100% funded of reserves. They wanted to do that because, as we all know, Hawaii is a great destination. They have a significant condominium housing stock, and they wanted to prevent that housing stock from falling into decay or disrepair. Now, that 1991 law was passed. It was supposed to go into effect in 1993, and it had a five-year deadline for compliance. And so, basically, that 1991 law said you need to be 100% funded by 1998. So quickly, The voters um, had their say. They rang the phones off the hooks of their legislators, and that law was repealed in 1992, even before it went into effect. It was watered down to only requiring the association be 50% funded. That's a much easier target. Um, In the years since, it's been watered down even further uh, so that the association only needs to be cash positive to demonstrate that they are They have a plan to be cash positive without reliance on future special assessments. Wow. So so it wasn't a few years ago. Hawaii did this back in 1991. In 92, it had already been repealed in terms of the fully funded mandate. Are there other states, Robert, that either have fully funded mandates or are considering them? There are no others that mandate them. There are many states that say associations must have sufficient reserves or 
adequate reserves. Most governing documents say that the board is empowered to collect sufficient funds to maintain and protect the assets of the corporation. You, of course, know that. You know, it's so interesting. You said that it, it, it really took just a few short months for, for people to push back in Hawaii against the fully funded mandate. And and I imagine this is an incredibly emotional argument. And again, this is not a board issue. This is a membership issue. In Florida, for instance, it's the members who waive reserves. The board is required to pass an operational budget with full, fully funded reserves. In Florida, it, that's for roof, painting, paving, and any other item for which the deferred maintenance or replacement cost exceeds $10,000. Here's the thing, though. Then you put it out to the members. So you've got some boards that automatically put it out to the members for a full waiver. But the reality is the law doesn't require them to put it out. The members do have the right to waive. But in my opinion, you don't have to ask them to waive. And so one of the issues is perhaps stop asking the members if they want to waive. Now, no, most sets of governing documents, Robert, do have a mechanism whereby the members, if they don't like what the board is doing, they can call for a special meeting, then they could have a, a waiver or partial funding vote. But I think what's happened, what we see happen time and again, is that members are being given an option to waive, maybe, maybe make it a little harder for them to do so. What are your thoughts? My understanding, again, I come at this from a professional engineer and a reserve study provider. It's hard for my brain to comprehend that anyone other the board than the board of directors sets the budget. And it's been this way for many years that the owners in the state of Florida have the right for a line item veto of reserve contributions. The roof is going to deteriorate. Just because the roof doesn't send the bill each month doesn't mean that that bill is unlike any other that needs to be repaid. It's exceedingly rare for the members to have the right to approve a budget. I I can't say that I've never seen it, Robert. I have seen two sets of governing documents over the two and a half decades I've been doing this that did have a requirement that the members approve the budget. But again, that is exceedingly rare. Now, what the members, again, this is Florida law right now we're discussing. If if, if the board proposes an operating budget um, and the assessments under that budget exceed 15% of the prior year's assessments, excluding reserves, then the membership in Florida has the option to substitute their own budget. Again, in 25 years, I've never seen that happen. So we get back to the issue of why do members not want to fund reserves? And one of the things that I've heard is that we just don't want the board to have that amount of money at their disposal. You know, <laughs> again, I see you laughing, but you know, I, some l- people l- say me, that we, we just don't yeah. want to have, we don't want to have yeah. a pot of money laying around for somebody to possibly tap into. So we'd rather go without reserves. What do you yeah. say to that? Well, first off, I think it's not con- primarily concern for the board. I think it's primarily the self-interest of the homeowners who'd rather have more money for themselves. Let's talk about your hypothetical where you talk about we're giving the board too much money. Look across the country, there is an extremely low risk of financial mismanagement of reserve funds. Even the most elementary financial controls can make that almost a negligible problem. You compare that to the true problem, which is a 100% problem where the board will not have sufficient funds to protect, maintain, and enhance the assets of the association. And is literally shooting the owners in the foot when you take away the power of the board to do the building maintenance, which minimizes the expenses at the building. When you when you perform timely ongoing maintenance, you minimize expensive deferred maintenance. And number two, doing that maintenance enhances property values. And that's in the self-interest of all the homeowners. And so allowing the board to do their job is in the best interest of every homeowner by minimizing the overall cost at the building because you're solving problems when they're small and you're doing a tremendous job of continually maximizing home values. I couldn't agree with you more, but we do have people with some short-term thinking, thinking, you know what? I'm not going to live here that long. Maybe some people, I'm not going to live that long. So I don't necessarily want to put money away each year. But I do think, Robert, that purchasers are becoming more sophisticated. Yeah, Donna, can I stop you on that? Let's just look at that right now. For the person who doesn't want to put money away, that is a opportunity to reframe the conversation rather than imagine or consider reserves as setting aside for the future for a rainy day or for a future expense, anything like that. Reserves should be framed as offsetting ongoing deterioration. That's all reserves are, is as the roof is gradually deteriorating, you're providing reserves to offset that ongoing cost. And when you take care of the present in that manner, the future takes care of itself. And everyone is only being asked 
to pay their fair share of current deterioration. We're not asking them to set money aside for the future. We see it in all aspects of our life. When I was doing a lot more traveling, I'd get out of the airplane, go to the rental car place. Mr. Nordland, here's your car. And they never once said, oh, by the way, Mr. Nordland, ha ha ha, sorry you. Um, Make sure you take enough time to get an oil change before you bring it back. (laughs) That's a special assessment. And when I check into the hotel, they never once said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Nordland, you have a reserved roommate at $169 per night. But tonight, there's an extra $500 fee because we're replacing the roof. In our world, We expect businesses to manage the ongoing costs of continuity, the ongoing costs of ownership. But in the community association world, it is amazing when we step back and look at the ability for these organizations to say, ah, we'll defer that to the future and continually run ourselves in crisis mode. So you want to reframe the entire conversation, the entire discussion. It's not, it's, you just want to keep up in real time. Just, just keep up. We're not asking anyone to set money aside for the future. All we're asking for is the new couple, the young couple who has a lot of bills as they're growing their family, they're anticipating a first child, or you go all the way to the older couple who's retired and on fixed income. All we're talking about is saying, just pay your fair share while you're using the common area assets of the association. Well, yeah, there, there's always this conversation, in, in, particularly in shared ownership communities, Robert, about equity. You know, you've got a new purchaser and then they get hit with a special assessment, you know, a month or two in and they say, oh, it's not fair. I just got here. But of course, if they're going to stay there for and live there for a number of years, they are going to get the value out of that. As I was saying, I think purchasers are becoming more and more sophisticated and they're asking um, when they're when they're making a purchase decision, are, do you have fully funded reserves? They're looking, by the way, their banks are looking. When our associations are looking to do major uh, renovations or capital improvement projects and they're, and they're applying to banks, banks are looking to see um, you know, how fiscally healthy they are. And, and certainly looking at the reserves is one yardstick. Can't agree with you more. In reserves, we are looking, the whole nature of reserves is looking at the physical assets of the property and the financial needs of the property. It's that combined uh, element. And when we look at that, That's one of the three disclosures in a reserve study is an evaluation of reserve fund strength. And that's wonderfully summarized in a number called percent funded. The associations that are in the zero to 30 percent funded range are in a weak financial state, or I should say combined physical and financial state. Associations that are in the middle range, 30 to 70 percent funded are fair. Uh, They have a periodic risk, uh, relatively low risk of special assessments, but about three out of 10 associations are in the strong range, which is above 70% funded. And those associations have maximized home values and no expectation of reserve um, special assessments. What do you do if you're in a community? And and I've seen a few of these. You're in a community where the members, the members just routinely waive the reserves. They don't even partially fund them. The associate, the board has no ability to borrow money and they have no ability to pass a special assessment without membership approval. We have some communities, Robert, where the members really believe that it's going to be governance by consensus and that if you can't get everybody to agree or at least a majority plus one to agree, we're not going to do anything. And in those associations tend to fall into a state of inertia. I, I really think there has to be some legislative change that when these documents were created if there's no ability to amend them. And there's also no ability for a board to do its job in terms of maintaining, repairing, and replacing the common elements. We're going to have to have some sort of a legislative change where we can override those kind of doc- what I call documentary handcuffs. Yeah, no, I, uh, I tend to believe that the future will have three forces working together. One is education, where boards do begin to understand that that roof deterioration is real. And they need to uh, collect for it and reserve contributions can't be deferred. That's There's an educational aspect. Number two is I trust that the, the major economic factors, the lenders and the insurance companies will begin to look at the reserves, uh, specifically the percent funded, to identify the risk levels at that association. So they know what exactly what they're getting into. And then the third component is the legislation appropriate, responsive legislation. And what I'm spending some of my time with at this point in time, literally, is communicating with legislators asking me, Robert, what should we do? And I say, well, let me help you with some best practices because I don't want you to overreact. 
Well, that's good advice. And, and and I want to talk to you a little bit later on about what some of those recommendations you're making to legislators. And I want to know across the board, you know, we've got a lot of people listening around the country, actually even around the world. But um, one of the things I want to ask you, Robert, is what do you believe are the principal factors compelling a community to fully fund reserves? Do those factors vary depending on the community? For example, are fully funded reserves more important for older buildings in geographically vulnerable areas? Does the age of the residents or the nature of the resident population, like renters versus owners, matter? So what are those reasons? Well, the reasons are so the board has the money to take care of the building, basically to uh, execute their plan to or their responsibility. Reserves are important at every stage. They're important in the early stages, as uh, you indicated earlier, and in, inertia or momentum. So the, the homeowners, when the building is brand new, don't cancel reserve contributions and think, oh, everything's fine. That'll last forever because everything is deteriorating every day beginning from day one. So getting appropriate expectations. So in the early years, every owner is indeed paying their fair share. It's also very important um, for senior, let's say retirees, where they are not in a financial position to handle a special assessment. It may be most important for them because if the board has been collecting the appropriate amount of reserves over the years, then they have the money. So when the roof starts to leak and the roofer says it's going to be $100,000 and the board in unison falls off their chairs and then they look at their reserve study and say, oh, we've got the money. And they repair the roof and it, everything is fine. And they are able to report in the annual meeting. Uh, you probably noticed back in March that we had our major roof project that went off without a hitch. A couple change orders. It went two or three or 4% over budget, no big deal. And the next big project in 2022 will be redoing the pool area when, don't worry, we'll get you all new patio furniture at that time. So hang with us in 2021. It's a matter of communication. It's a matter of being prepared, but having a strongly funded reserve fund, over 70% funded, has some incredible advantages. You don't have to be 100% funded to gain those advantages. You know, some of these bad habits start with the Developer Controlled Association, where you've got the developer waiving reserves as well. So, you know, but you also said something very interesting to me, Robert, because listen, buildings have a lifespan. So brand new building, just post-transition from developer control. uh, I liken that to, you know, an adolescent. Remember the foolishness of youth, okay? Never thought you were going to get sick. You were impervious to everything. (laughs) Exactly. It's the same with some of these young communities. They just got through a transition from developer control. Unfortunately, sometimes they're already in a hole because of a a, a design or a construction defect and they don't even know about it yet. You know, that's why we we urge associations that are transitioning to do an engineering report, even though in many states, the developers are required to produce one, do an independent one, make sure you get a clean bill of health right from the get-go, that you do not have any construction or design defects. But again, you know, youth, whether it's referring to a person or referring to a community or a building, it glosses over a lot of problems that as you age, then they surface. And if, you know, if I heard you correctly, try to resist that. Try to start out from the, on the right foot. Unfortunately, sometimes the bad habits have been instilled from the Developer Controlled Association. Yeah. We can't blame the developer for all the problems. There are some developers that do a great job of setting the association up for success. There are some developers that basically leave a crying baby on the doorstep of the first year board of directors, the uh, homeowner-based board. So Donna, it's a, it's a, interesting situation. I think every new association needs to be cautious. They need to understand that the the developer's motives are different than their motives. The developer's motives are to sell, make a profit, and move on. So the board members, the homeowners who have a multi-year vested interest, they're the ones who want to commission an independent reserve study early and find out, okay, what are the real deterioration costs of our our association? What's ongoing? We have 1.2 miles of asphalt, not 0.8 miles of asphalt. And we have three tennis courts, not the four that the builder had in their great plans and in the sales brochure. Uh, It's important for early boards to make sure they have a good basis for getting through the first five years and then from five to 10. And uh, for transition time, it's so important for boards to transition a qualified transition study where indeed they are looking up and checking up on the, what the developer has done and developing a punch list for, oh, you forgot every 
uh, parking stop in the parking lot. <laughs> you know, you little know, things you, like that yeah. that have been forgotten. And those are revealed in a transition study. And oh, by the way, on the east side of this building, all the balconies are sloping in, not sloping out. You well, this to- that, that, that kind of inspection can actually help with your insurance appraisal. So, so we have found sometimes that associations, the insurance agents have been relying upon inaccurate appraisals. In one community, they had them down with six elevators. They only had four. And so, but year after year, when the insurance went out to bid for renewal, it was based on an inaccurate appraisal, an older appraisal. So I, I think you make a, I think you make a great point and you're right. Listen, developers are there to do a job and, and, Thank God they're doing a job because we need places to live. We need them to build buildings. Everybody plays a role in this. You're right. The developers are looking to build a a quality product and to sell out inventory. But sometimes the governing documents they create do not mesh long-term with successful association operations. And that's where community association attorneys like me come in and try to, if I can get in pre-transition. I can get them on a good footing. Correct. I can talk to the to developers council and say, look, some of this stuff we need, to, we need to amend it perhaps. And, you know, often they will say, great. And they still have the ability at that time for the developer to unilaterally amend. It becomes much more difficult after transition to get members all on the same page. So I, I, I completely agree with you. We did a reserve study for a new association and we reviewed the governing documents to find out the uh, association's common area responsibilities. And it was a townhome association. And we were amazed that roofing and painting of the you know, eight buildings of this 100-unit association were not common area. And so we asked the, the contact why that is. And they said, oh, we got homeowner association governing documents, plant development governing documents, not townhome governing documents. And I said, well, that's a problem. How about we presume that you're going to get that fixed and we do the reserve study presuming that those, what should be common area, will be common area because you can't have a unit owner in the middle of a building trying to get their roof done separate from the units adjacent to them in that townhouse structure. So again, we got to thank developers for giving us housing stock. Some are better than others, but uh, there's a high workload for new boards and there's a high workload for boards at aging properties. It's Emerson, you nature, don't you don't want this to become your full time job. You volu- you only no. volunteered to sit on a board. Correct. <laughs> Presumably, you have other interests in lives in your life. You've got jobs. Many of these people, you've got family concerns. So, but to your point, I did have that Robert in two of my communities where they were attached villas, but they had a shared roof. But guess what? The unit owner was responsible for their portion of the roof. So in one building yeah. and, and a storm came through, two of the homeowners had coverage, had insurance coverage to replace the roof. Two did not. We changed that. I call it condominiumizing. And we changed the insurance um, obligation and shifted it from the owners to where it should have been, which was the association as a common element roof, because the way it was set up, it, it just didn't work. Donna, but, good for you. Good for you. For, Robert, I want you now. We're going to do a little role playing here. I'm I'm on a board, okay? okay. I I'm in a high rise condo. We've got a okay. hundred units. We've got four elevators. We've got two tennis courts, one pool, an entrance gate. There's security. I moved here because you know this was um, going to be the place where I was going to enjoy my the, my later years in life. No I've lawn called- to mow. I've got an extra guest room for my kids or grandkids. Great view. I get it. Right. Exactly. So I moved in here. Now I'm on the board. Nobody's done a reserve study. Somebody says, let's call Robert. I'm calling you. Walk me through the process. What What is this going to cost? How long is it going to take? Who are you going to send out? First thing, thank you for calling me. Um, <laughs> you could uh, contact any, I would recommend contacting a qualified reserve study professional. There's two credentials to look for in the field someone with an RS after the name, reserve specialist, or PRA, professional reserve analyst. Um, They're roughly equivalent, um, but look for a qualified individual. That person is going to ask a bunch of questions about the property because the cost is going to be directly related to the magnitude and complexity of the project. So I'm going to ask how many units, you say 100, how many stories, you say 20, how many pools, how many elevators. And we're starting to get an idea of how many hours it's going to take us on site, the complexity of all our follow-up stuff. That's what we do. And we'll say, have you had a reserve study before? You say no. And there are three types of reserve studies, levels of service in National Reserve Study uh, Standards. A full reserve study that is created from scratch, an update with site visit, 
and I'll update no site visit. So at this point in time, you need a full reserve study. It's the most expensive of the three, but it's what you need. We're going to quantify all those things. We're going to measure the carpeting in the hallway. We're going to measure the roofing square foot. We're going to measure the size of the guest parking lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to quantify everything, get the size of the boilers. Did I say we give you a price? So we give you a price for this full reserve study. And then you take it to the board and they say, that sounds reasonable. We thought it was going to be more. Go. And so we're hired. Typically, a reserve study will take on the order of a month or two. Mm. Okay. There is time to coordinate the site inspection with the association. That may be a board member. It may be the building engineer. It may be the reserve committee. But we coordinate that. So we're there at that time armed with uh, measuring equipment, documentation equipment, maybe our iPads, maybe paper, a digital camera. And we are just... Uh, absorbing information, taking hundreds of pictures. And then we go back and then we get into the research phase where we are uh, asking, okay, who is your HVAC vendor? Who's your elevator vendor? I want to compare my observations with them. Are you so looking get, at their Are you looking at their maintenance records over the years? I'm not looking at their maintenance records. Uh, typically, the uh, telltales are patently obvious. Mm. I have been in high-rise buildings like you describe where go up to the mechanical room on the roof and it looked like it was a nuclear sub. Everything was clean, brightly painted. The hot water lines not only were colored differently than the cold water lines, everything was shiny, the direction of flow, you know, it was it was incredible. It was well done. And I asked the guy, were you in the Navy? He said, yep, I was on a sub. And <laughs> there you like, go. <laughs> it looks like it. That place was squared away. When I go to some places where the building engineer fumbles to even get the right key for the mechanical room. And it's dusty, it's dark, the lights don't work. And it's usually patently obvious what's going on at an association. Maintenance is usually very obvious. So then after we're done, we get into the research phase where we're comparing our notes to the building and specialists. And then we confer with the board. Let me double check this. Do you stash the... Um, poolside furniture away in the winter or is it out all year? You know, little details like that. And we said, okay, here it is, um, whatever date it is, what's your latest reserve balance? Then we do the financial projections and then we develop the reserve study. And that's roughly a regularly a two-month period. Do you send out different specialists, Robert, like a roofing specialist to do the, check the roof, a pave, you know, an asphalt specialist to look at the asphalt, a waterproofing, building envelope specialist to look at that? No, um, we are in the reserve safe field are generalists. Having that RS or PRA behind our name identifies us as exactly that. Now, what that does is mean that we are very familiar with knowing what we're seeing. We also know the limits of what we see. I am not a large man, but I've been on roofs where I was very uncomfortable just because the roof was flexing under my weight. I've been on roof ladders where they had not paid attention to taking good care of things. So we know when to ask questions and point the board of directors towards, hey, you need to look into this. We are just your budget consultants. And that may be, as I indicated earlier, reaching out to the elevator people, the boiler people. What's the story on this? When was the last time the burner was uh, refurbished? Those kinds of things. But we will assign someone on our staff appropriate to the property. We're going to send for this building someone very familiar, very experienced with high rises. That's a very different skill than someone who we would send on a wide open planned development homeowner association community where all we're doing is looking at the asphalt, the entry gate, and the tot lot in the way back. So different skills. Uh, we have specialists within our office. Most reserve state companies will have specialists. And uh, there's different nuances that we want to make sure we're doing our best for the client so we send the right person out there. You mentioned a reserve specialist and a professional reserve analyst. Now, is there a certification program, a training, any sort of educational requirement for somebody to call themselves uh, I'm a reserve specialist or I'm a professional reserve analyst. Yes. In the mid-90s, it was the same group of us who developed national reserve study standards. So they both have the same original DNA. The RS is uh, administered and promoted by the National uh, Community Association Trade Organization, CAI. The other is a private, what do I say, 501c3 professional organization, the APRA. Association of Professional Reserve Analysts. So they're, they're roughly equivalent 
they have the same basic stuff. Those have three requirements. One is an educational background, basically college technical degree. Number two, an experience background where it's a number of years and a number of reserve studies that you've performed. And three, a uh, certification, basically a peer review that you uh, adhere to standardized uh, wording, uh, nomenclature, and standardized calculations for the work that we do. So part of the challenge is teaching boards to become more sophisticated consumers, whether they're hiring an engineer or hiring a CPA, hiring an attorney, hiring a reserve specialist. So going back to going back to my example, you, you come out, Robert, you, you impress the heck out of us. But the, I turn to the director who's next to me and and she says, we can just ask Lou, the roofing contractor, to go up on the roof and tell us how many, you know, how much remaining estimated useful life the roof has and what it's going to cost in ten years. And we can ask, you know, Bill, the plumber, to do the same thing with our plumbing. Correct. And how do you counter that? Because yeah. I'm well, sure you run into that where where oh, boards absolutely you either use somebody who's on the board, who's the retired engineer. But by the way, this happens to me all the time with retired New York attorneys, personal injury attorneys on the board. Um, I'm sure you run into this with, you know, look, we have a 20-year relationship with Lou, who's our roofer. We'll just ask him. Yeah. Or the building engineer. There are some times where the the maintenance manager, the building engineer knows the place like the back of their hand. And we, after 15 minutes of chatting with that person, we realize this guy is the man. This lady is the the person. They know everything. And we spend the rest of the days talking to that person and making sure that we are getting the benefit of months or years of insights rather than just what we're seeing on site. But in answer to your question, I keep getting sidetracked. There are those board members or committee members that can do a good job. And we've seen a few and we we congratulate them. But those are wonderful exceptions. Uh, the challenges that associations have doing it internally are lack of independence, meaning they're the ones that are going to end up paying the reserve contributions. A lack of experience. Do they really know what they're looking for, how to characterize the numbers, how to properly do the calculations? And then the third is so unfortunate. It's the tendency of the board to not value their results as well as if they would have paid for someone to tell them. And so you can have, and we've seen it, some wonderfully well prepared. And they come to us and say, Robert, how come the board's not looking at um, my reserve study? Can you look at it? And I'm like, oh, darn. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll look at it. And I'm telling you, I spent hours with this one guy who was a World War II vet, not too many of them around. He'd done a fantastic reserve study, but the board said, well, it was just old Joe. But boy, boy, isn't that true in corporate culture that outside paid consultants are sometimes valued more? And But at the end of the day, you need the, you need credibility. When you're when you're trying to get by and when you're trying to 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 help people understand the importance of doing this, credibility is definitely going to come into play. So just to your example, Joe may have had an excellent reserve study, but if it's not going, it's not something that's going to be met. Well, it's probably going to be met with a jaundiced eye by the board yes. because they've just know they've known Joe for too long. Yep. And if Joe says our reserve contributions need to go up by twenty dollars a month, the board's going to say. I maybe we'll go five. And Joe's 40 hours of work on this project kind of goes to waste when, um, if the board would have paid the couple grand or whatever it is for a professional, um, maybe they would have taken that uh, counsel more seriously and uh, implemented change. The bottom line is if the uh, volunteer is not in a position to effect change, then it's a, a doomed adventure. Robert, I want to circle back because when I was asking you to walk me through the process of producing the reserve study, you mentioned three different options. It sounds to me that the, the biggest option is you come into a community that really hasn't done a reserve study or at least hasn't done one with you. So you, you do the, the on-site, you, do the, uh, you go in and you do the whole job. But if somebody's using you periodically, it sounded to me, and maybe you can revisit this, that maybe they need a little bit less each time. Is that correct? That's correct. If they haven't had a reserve study done according to National Reserve Study Standards, then we come in and we do a full reserve study. And that's the quantification. That's the establishing of the component list according to National Reserve Study Standards. We give them a good document. Now, if they have a volunteer committee, it is possible they can tweak that for a few years. That's well within the capability of 
a volunteer, or at least following the multi-year plan that we give them. The vast majority of reserve studies done in the country are update reserve studies, one of the two different update products. An update with a site visit is commonly done every third or fifth year across the country. The styles vary, and those range from 50% to 80% of the original full reserve study. The no site visit update is commonly done in the years in between that with site visit update. It gives the boards the, the critical updated information that allows them to understand, okay, how has the crazy things that happened in 2020 affected us? What's happening with the incredible jump in inflation that we're seeing right now? How do we need to rebalance? That stuff can be done in a no site visit update. And no site visit updates are commonly 25% of the original cost or commonly hundreds of dollars, maybe capping at a a thousand bucks, something like that. And I imagine it's it's much quicker to get that no site visit report produced. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, it's so Robert- simpler. It's quicker. It's a nice update. It keeps the board on track. Again, reserve contributions are one of the association's largest budget line items, and it's a very simple investment to make sure that things haven't drifted. And even in the last two years, there's a lot of reasons for things to drift. The reserve contributions, not according to plan. Expenses, not according to plan. It's a very simple way to get back on track. So you know I can't let you leave this podcast without asking you to explain the difference between pooled and oh, line item <laughs> reserves. You know you weren't getting out of here without explaining that. Uh, first thing to understand is that the expenses themselves have not changed. We're talking about the same set of expenses. The only question is, how are you going to calculate them? It may be the same as understanding that you're going to go to the grocery store. Am I going to take my electric car? We're going to take my gasoline car. It's the same trip to the grocery store. So pooled and straight line are the two different methodologies. One is more restrictive, and that's the straight line method. It means you put your reserves into all the different categories of expenses. And so we have all these little buckets of money, and it becomes an accounting challenge, and it becomes, it's just not optimized for the association because let's say you need to do the roof project one year early and you're short of money. What are you going to do? You're going to special assess? No, you really just borrow some of the painting money or maybe some of the asphalt money. And that indeed is all that the pooling method is. It sees the reserve fund as one pool of money. It allows the professional analyst, the professional reserve study provider to design a funding plan that uses those funds most effectively. So bottom line is we are strong advocates for the pooled method in National Reserve Study Standard that's called the cash flow method. It is in the best interest of the association. Uh, It is advantageous for so many reasons. Even with the same funding goal, the same funding objective, it results in lower reserve contributions. And Donna, you ask, how can that be if it's the same set of expenses? And that's because the reserve expenses or the reserve contributions in the initial years, when you're using the straight line method, are significantly higher because they're very rapidly reducing any reserve deficit. Over 20 or 30 years, they're going to work out to be about the same But if you have A, a straight line based reserve study in your left hand, and B, a pooled or cash flow based reserve study in your right hand, the reserve contribution recommendation for the first year is going to be lower in the cash flow recommended reserve contribution because the bottom line is you're comparing only one year, not the entire plan. Mm Got it. Listen, I'm seeing that trend. We're seeing in Florida, at least, more a move towards pooled reserves, again, because of the Good. flexibility that's built in. And, and by the way, folks, when we talk about borrowing from one reserve, like if you are straight line, borrowing from the roof to pay for the painting and waterproofing, that requires a membership vote. So again, every time when you've got those straight line reserves in Florida, you will need to take that out to a membership vote if you want to borrow from one bucket to pay for expenses that are for another bucket. So right. the pool, I think, of, just yeah, gives you a lot more flexibility. A lot of administrative overhead. Yeah, absolutely. In that straight line method. So staying on Florida for a moment, in Florida, the legislature mandated the use of disclaimer language in big, bold font to be used on the voting materials anytime members vote to waive reserves. Now, the purpose of that requirement is pretty simple. They want to warn people 
that they're possibly going to be subject to large special assessments if they waive the reserves. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to read the language. It says, in, picture this in 20 font. Waiving of reserves in whole or in part or allowing alternative uses of existing reserves may result in unit owner liability for payment of unanticipated special assessments regarding those items. So in Florida, if you want to have your members waive reserves, that language has to be there. I will tell you my thought is that people don't even read that and it, their eyes glaze over because it's the same language they see on the limited proxy in the ballot each year. So Robert, how effective do you think that kind of disclaimer is in getting people not to vote to waive or only partially fund reserves? Is it scary enough? It is not scary enough. It is exactly the, has exactly the same effectiveness as the Surgeon General's warning on a pack of cigarettes. If people want to buy cigarettes, they buy cigarettes. And that Surgeon General's warning just, you know, they say, ah, I'll take my chances. Well, the deal with reserves is that it's not a possibility of payment of unanticipated special assessment. It's a 100% chance that you will get special assessed for this. The, the money doesn't come from nowhere. The money comes from the homeowners. The roof will fail. The elevator will need modernization. The asphalt will need to be resurfaced 100%. So if you're waiving reserves, there is a 100% chance people will have to pay for those expenses in a special assessment. Not a possibility. You can maybe think about that with smoking. Uh, maybe someone else will get cancer, but there is a 100% chance of the building getting special assessed if you waive reserve contributions. At some point, at some point, at you're some going point. to need, yeah, you're going to need to do this. And yet we see these waiver votes go through, not just by the, remember, it's a majority of a quorum. It's a majority of the people present in voting. That's not a super high threshold. And yet when it comes to, to waivers or only partial funding in some communities, we're seeing memberships, the members being aligned on this topic, 80% or more. Does yeah. that shock you? No, I think it's the board continuing to mischaracterize two things. One is they're mischaracterizing reserves as for the future. They are not. Reserve contributions are for ongoing deterioration. Everyone should pay their fair share. It's very simple. When I walk into, or recently when I walked into a grocery store and there was a line, I got in the end of the line. We understand what's fair in this country and it's fair to pay your fair share. And number two, Board members are continually looking at the wrong target. They're looking at lower monthly assessments. That is their fool's gold target. The true target is taking care of the building, which results in maximized property values and makes the most money for everyone. And that's done when they take 50 bucks a month, whatever it is, from the homeowners on a steady, ongoing basis, offsetting deterioration. So the money is there and you see that in the reserves percent funded. It's a very simple number. That's what the board should be looking at. Is that number going up? Is that number going down? And where are we? Is that number in the weak range for our association, the fair range or the strong range? That's the number that should be reported by the board of directors. But see here, I don't think that this is as much a, a failure on the part of the board, Robert, because remember, like in a state like Florida, and I'm going to ask you if there's other states like this, the board passes a budget with full reserves, okay? okay. It's the members who are voting to waive it, and perhaps it's the education that needs to be, it's education that needs to be given to the members to say, this is not saving for a rainy day. This is what we need to do as an ongoing basis. Because people do want to keep assessments low. But again, I don't think this is as much the board mischaracterizing what reserves do. Although I'm sure, look, board members are, they live in the, you know, they live in and own these units too. Yep. I'm sure there's some board members. They got to pull their wallet out or their Exactly. Too. They got to pay it. They got to pay it as well. But I also think this is a bigger issue of educating the members because ultimately in some states, like a state like Florida, it's the members that are really driving this engine. Again, unless we can educate boards to say, Maybe don't put it out there for a waiver. Maybe if they really want to work for it, make them work for a waiver. Otherwise, and I do have boards like that where this is the budget. It's got full reserves. We're not putting it out for a vote on a waiver or a partial funding. And in those communities, it goes through. Um, when we look around the industry, we see effective boards have four consistent characteristics. 
They care about the association and their job. They're curious. They know what they know and what they don't know. They look around, they see things, and they ask questions. They ask questions of their attorney, their manager, their landscaper, their reserve state professional. Number three, they have the courage to do the right thing, say the right thing, speak the truth. And number four, they are good communicators. As you suggested, if there is a vote, they know in advance how it's going to go because they've pounded the pavement around the association explaining why this needs to be passed. We had one client who was uh, had some significant balcony problems. And I forget how many units, you know, 50 units, something like that. And the balconies had significant concerns. Uh, t- and they ha- had one repaired and it was a couple thousand dollars. And the board said, we got to pass a special assessment, get all our balconies replaced. And they said, um, you know, pass a special assessment. And the owners voted it down. They tried again and the owners voted it down. And they reach out to us and say, hey, Robert, we know we've got a balcony problem. We just don't have the money. And I said, well, try a third time. And one of their board members had the brilliant idea of stacking the debris, the dry rot, and the broken wood from that failed balcony right by the guardhouse entry. Everyone saw it. So Every a visual reminder. They, yep. A visual. And they all, oh, gee, that's going to happen to my balcony? And all of a sudden, it wasn't Unit 13's problem. It was my problem. So boards need to work on their salesmanship and communication skills. That may be a new thing, but I think it is... It's asking a, the, it is um, asking that, a lot, though, Robert. Yeah. You know, you're dealing with your... It's one thing to have these skills in your professional life, but... In a community, you're dealing with your neighbors. It's a living together relationship. You really can't avoid it. You you see them. And again, I've seen it. A lot of people think of these boards as a monolithic entity, the board. Over years, you know, I'm sure you've seen it in your communities. You've got different boards. You've got different perspectives, so, you know, different philosophies. People come and go on the boards. And as you have additions and subtractions from the boards, sometimes you get very significant shifts in, in prioritization and in perspectives and all the rest of this. So we were really not dealing with a monolith here. We are dealing Correct. with a very fluid um, board situation, usually. Correct. I totally agree. The board may be five people, but it's usually not the same five people for a number of years. Some At some associations, it changes every year. At some association, there's staggered terms. So there's a little bit more continuity, but it is in, incumbent upon us. And that's exactly why I'm spending time today to help spread the news of best practices. I know, Donna, you do it. You're the one with this podcast. We're trying to encourage best practices to help our clients and our all the other ones that aren't our clients understand what best practices are so we can do our best to move our industry forward successfully. Well, I think you've done a lot to educate our, our, our listeners today, and I thank you very much for joining us, Robert. Donna, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review so even more people can take it to the board. Lastly, please visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more information.